All right, what is up, my brothers from another mother? So today's video is a book review. I haven't done a good book review in a while, so looking forward to this one with you. Uh, the book is called Sex at Dawn, and it's going to get a little weird in this video. I'm going to promise you that right now. I need my specs for this because I'm going to read you the uh, book description before I get into my experience. Since Darwin's day, we've been told that sexual monogamy comes natural to our species. Mainstream science, as well as religion and cultural institutions, has, ma has maintained that men and women evolved in families which man's possessions and, prote and protection were exchanged for women's fertility and fidelity. But the narrative is collapsing. Fewer and fewer couples are getting married and divorce rates keep climbing as adultery and flagging libido drag down seemingly solid marriages. How can reality be reconciled? With the accepted narrative, it can't be. According to renegade thinkers Christopher Ryan and Casilda Jetha, these are the two authors, uh, they're basically debunking everything we know about sex. So I'm going to leave it at that because it's a pretty long description. I'm going to talk about my own experience with this book because it's been a game changer. I've talked about game changing books in the past for me. And um, the one that really changed the lens in which I viewed the world in the past was probably it's going to get some AC on here because it's starting to warm up. It was probably uh, The Rational Male by the one and only Rolo Tomasi. Link below in the description if you haven't got it. I'm also going to link this book below because I'm going to add this to my recommended reading for all men going forward. Uh, it is a serious game changer in the way that you're going to view relationships between men and women uh, and your entire perception of the way things should be. What is this dude doing over here? Um, trying to get out of a parking lot in a Costco can be a freaking nightmare sometimes. Anyway, so um, it, it really gets you to question a lot of the stuff that you've been led to believe, told to believe, that you've, uh, you know, it's religion, society, parental upbringing, about marriage and everything. Of course, you know, for those of you that are newer to the channel, I'm in my early 40s, divorced, uh, eight-year-old daughter, so I subscribe to the whole get married, have kids, you know, be a man, do the right thing, blah, blah, blah. This guy's clearly not going anywhere. And um, everything will be tickety-boo and fair and all that good stuff. Thank you. And um, it wasn't. So a, a good friend of mine a couple months ago recommended this book to me, and he's like, Describing it to us all over this uh, dinner. Let me just cover the lens there so you don't get any glare uh, over this dinner and um, Essentially the way our bodies have evolved is In the blink of an eye. So the time that it would take me right now to blink my eyes is modern time in the big scheme of things with human sexuality human beings um, you know, we've been human beings for millions of years on the earth and it's only the last 10,000 odd years uh, where we've tried to behave in a monogamous fashion where we've pair bonded longer term. I think we're pair bonding creatures, yeah, but uh, pair bonding longer term in a monogamous fashion for the rest of our lives as a marriage or a long term relationship exclusive to one another. Uh, that's only new and, and that's only happened recently because of agriculture, uh, as the authors describe in the book, where we started to want to take ownership of certain things in our lives. You know, it's funny. I did a, uh, a video about materialism and trying to minimize my life. And here I have come across a book that talks about how agriculture has created um, this sense of we're trying to own shit. Like uh, it says so in the Bible, thou shall not covet thy neighbor's wife, his horse, his ox, his property, his house, and blah, blah, blah. So it's not like the wife is, you know, don't impose on the wife and get in her pants. It's like, don't touch my stuff is what it's about. And it was the, um, you know, the need to try to pass on our, um, our stuff to our, to our kids. So we wanted a long-term pair bonding scenario when agriculture came up, when, you know, rather than being nomadic hunter gatherers that would wander around, which is what we did for millions of years, basically eating what we would kill and harvesting what we could, could gather. Um, and we lived in these nomadic tribes of, you know, 20, 40, 50, you know, small groups of humanoids banding together, traveling around, uh, not being sexually monogamous. There's a lot of evidence that we were never sexually monogamous uh, for a good part of our evolutionary history. And I'll talk about why in a sec because it all breaks down to the human body and our genitalia and stuff like that. 
So it was agriculture that, that basically uh, forced us to change into monogamous relationships, marriage, being able to pass down our stuff to our kids because we wanted to know that, you know, the person we pair bonded with when we had stuff like agriculture, our farmland, our oxen and so on and so forth was passed down to our children. So we wanted to know that the person that we were uh, reproducing with, they were in fact our, our children. So that's that's a blink of an eye, let's say in a 24 hour day. So a very small part of recent human history. But the way that we've behaved is not in a monogamous fashion. We've always, um, you know, behaved in a fairly open manner when it comes to sexual exclusivity. Um, again, you've got to read the book to really get the details. And guys, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm hopefully going to get an interview with Christopher Ryan, who's who's the author in the, in the book and also the guy that's been doing many of the talks. He's done a TED talk. He's been on the Joe Rogan podcast a ton of times. Um, so hopefully later on this week. So if you have a question for him, put it in the comments below. If you've read the book, if you haven't, I recommend you grabbing it. It's definitely worth the read. Anyway, so to get back to the sexual ex exclusivity and the lies we've been told about this, uh, this stuff, you know, again, I guess this is blue pill, red pill thinking. You know, blue pill is a narrative we've always been told, get married, settle down, be with the same person till you die. Red pill is kind of opening your eyes to the way things are and the way that we've evolved. And the fact of the matter is our bodies are sending tremendous, huge amounts of signals to us that we haven't evolved to be uh, long-term monogamous pair bonders. We're pair bonders, yes, but not long-term monogamous pair bonders. And it all comes down to, well, a number of things. Like, for example, um, our, our closest relative is the bonobo chimp, uh, the chimpanzee and the bonobo chimp, the, chimp, the bonobo more so than the chimpanzee. And the difference uh, percentage-wise between us genetically and them is about 1.7%. And to put that in perspective, the genetic difference between the African elephant and the Indian ele elephant is greater than the difference between us and the bonobo chimp. Now, the way that our bodies are, um, comparatively speaking, you know, as primates, because all we are is animals. I mean, I'm just an animal driving a car right now. I'm, I'm no different than the birds that are flying in the sky and everybody else. We're just animals. Um, it is that we tend to try to differentiate ourselves from you know other animal species simply because we drive a car we have a road system or a healthcare system and so on and so forth but they're human beings are the only truly sexually promiscuous um, animals on earth so what that means is for every thousand times we have sex roughly there's one birth uh, versus a silverback gorilla for example which for every 10 to 12 instances of sexual intercourse there's one birth so we have sex when when females are, are not ovulating, when they're pregnant, when they're lactating, when they're menstruating. Like we have sex all the time. We have sex in places that can't possibly result in a pregnancy. You know, oral sex, anal sex, all kinds of stuff. Human beings have sex in every single possible manner, and many of which are not even designed to result in a pregnancy. It's a social event for human beings, is what it is. Versus a primate like a like a gorilla. So there's another thing. That that is talked about in the book where it's gorillas are significantly bigger than their like male gorillas are significantly bigger than the females and that's because sperm competition happens outside of the reproductive tract so uh, the male silverback that has his harem of women his bitches whatever it is that they call them right uh, he is he's basically the only one that gets to reproduce with them and that happens like sperm competition happens on a physical level for them they're physically imposing they're large creatures they're, they're impossibly strong they have the, they have considerably more strength than a human male does and they basically pound the crap out of any other gorilla that's smaller than them that tries to have sex with their females and that's how sperm competition is guaranteed you know the strongest the fittest the most badass gorilla passes on his sperm to his females which goes on through time sort of thing now the interesting thing about the reproductive parts of a male gorilla is their penis is like the size of my pinky finger like half of my pinky it's about an inch long they've got a tiny little dick and their balls their testicles are the size of kidney beans I'm not kidding they're tiny so comparatively speaking to their bodies human beings have massive penises and, and testicles compared to gorillas now let's go to the bonobo chimp and the, and the chimpanzees which which are also very close relatives that do have a lot of sex and much of it does not result in, in pregnancy so really it's human beings uh, bonobos and chimps and dolphins which have sex for pleasure but let's talk about the primates so on a primate level the um, bonobos well, they've got massive balls. They've got huge balls. They're about the size of like duck eggs, I think is what they said in the book. 
So human beings have nuts about the size, like testicles about the size of uh, eggs, like small eggs, medium, medium to small eggs. And in the past, we, you know, there's a lot of signals and signs that we had larger testicles. So it's only in the last 10,000 years that our balls have begun to shrink, uh, likely because of the advent of religion and, and, you know, selling us the narrative that you should be married and have kids and stay monogamous to one woman. We've, our, our reproductive tracts are very, very similar to the bonobo chimp. And the way that um, reproductive DNA competes is in the reproductive tract. So in the female's uh, reproductive tracts or uterus and all that sort of stuff. Basically, a bonobo chimp or a chimpanzee doesn't have tiny little nuts like a gorilla because they don't fight off the other chimps. Sperm competition happens inside. So the female basically has sex with as many males as she possibly can when she's ovulating, and then the strongest sperm will fertilize her egg. And that's the way that they reproduce. Now there's a lot of signals in modern human beings even today that we're still designed to behave that way. Even the shape of the uh, human male penis is you know, such that we know it's got that little you know, cap on the top of it. And we, you know, we have no idea what that's for. I guess I've always assumed my entire life that all animals have a, a dick like that, uh, but they don't. In fact, um, chimpanzees, gorillas, bonobos—they've got these skinny little, kind of tiny dicks. They're not—they're not very big. I mean, bonobo chimps and chimpanzees have bigger penises than a gorilla, but the human penis, proportionally speaking, as a ratio to the human body, is massive. It's huge, and. One of the other things that happens is when we have sex, we have sex on average about 10 minutes, whereas most of these animals do it for anywhere from five to 15 seconds. So a gorilla, five to, five to seven seconds, a bonobo chimp slightly longer, but their entire purpose is to have sex to just you know, dump their giant load. And then the next guy comes along an hour later or whenever and dumps his load. And whoever's got the best sperm wins at the end of it, basically. Now. With human beings, the way our penis is designed to operate within a vaginal tract is we pump for like 10 minutes. And one, that creates a vacuum, which is why a lot of you guys will, and women as well watching this, will know that there's things that we call pussy farts. Um, because it's not just the, the pumping that creates a vacuum to evacuate other sperm from other males, but it's also that shape of the head which pulls out think about it, the shape of the penis head is designed as you pump in and pull out, it pulls out anything that might be in there. Okay. And then when you come, the thing about that is we, we usually shoot about five to seven shots. The first shot has antigens and, and chemical compounds in it that are designed to kill off any sperm that aren't yours. The last shot has chemicals and antigens in it designed to protect your sperm from any other, from any other foreign object that might destroy it. And the other interesting thing about this, and I'm gonna leave it at this one last thought because I could go on for an hour about this book because it's such a game changer, is when a female has an orgasm, it changes the pH chemistry of her reproductive tract. And females usually only have orgasms. Have you ever had a woman say to you guys, I love the way you smell, okay? That odor, that odoriferous that comes off your body. And then you'll probably notice it's the same woman that has these intense, strong orgasms, okay? The reason for that is the, the pH level in her vaginal tract changes to make it so that it's more friendly to the fertilization of her eggs. There's a lot of incredible stuff, a lot of incredible evidence in that book that I've mentioned. Uh, it's not a long book. It's a highly recommended read. It answers a lot of questions uh, that are certainly viewed from a red pill lens. Again, I'm looking to interview Chris Ryan, uh, hopefully later on this week. It's Sunday right now. I'm gonna try to put this out either tonight or tomorrow. Um, so you'll have an opportunity, if you have a question, if you've read the book, to post it below. Um, I'm not sure what questions I'm gonna have right now. I'm gonna have to think about it a little bit more. I wanna listen to the last few chapters again. There's so much evidence in that book that answers so many questions that I've had my entire life. Uh, so it is certainly a worthwhile read. Leave a comment below, guys. If you've read the book, I wanna hear your thoughts on it. Uh, if you haven't read the book and I've completely shocked you right now with the stuff that I've talked about, I wanna hear about that too. Leave, leave me a comment below. Thanks for watching the video. Smash the like button. Um, again, how do you support the channel? There's of course Patreon. Uh, there's of course, if you wanna book my time for coaching, Clarity is one-on-one -on -one done on the phone, billed by the minute. Uh, there's reach.me, again, links for both below where you can ask a personalized question and you get a personalized video response that's private on the platform. Have an amazing day.
Peace, my brothers and rational sisters. Later.